Hi, Matthias from 10 Minute Physics here. Today I will show you how to perform broad phase collision detection using bounding volume hierarchies. I will also present a very fast and clever way to create them. The problem we are looking into is to find all objects that overlap a given region, here the red rectangle. We can use this operation to perform broad phase collision detection for instance. For this we iterate through all the objects. For each object we set the region to the bounding box of the object. This way we detect all pair collisions. In the last tutorial we looked at the sweep and prune method. There we projected the bounding boxes of all objects onto the x-axis. Then we tested for overlaps of the projections while iterating from left to right. For 10,000 2D objects evenly distributed in the plane, we need about 100 overlap tests for each object. This is faster than the 10,000 tests for the brute force method of testing all objects against all other objects. But we want to do better. For 100 million objects arranged evenly in a cube, we need to perform about 100 times 100 tests per object. The problem with sweep and prune is that we only use one axis. The method I present today is much more efficient. It uses a bounding volume hierarchy. For n objects, it only has to perform about log 2 of n tests per object. I will explain in a minute what the log function is. Here, I just give some numbers. Here is an example in 2D. With 100 times 100 objects, the brute force method needs to do 10,000 tests per object and a million tests in total. As we just saw, Sweden Prune needs 100 tests per object, resulting in a million tests in total. With the use of a bounding volume hierarchy, we only need to perform about 13 tests per object. This yields 130,000 tests in total. In 3D, the situation is even more dramatic. The brute force method performs 1 million tests per object. This yields 1 trillion tests in total. Sweden Prune performs about 10,000 tests per object and 10 billion in total. The BVH requires about 20 tests per object and 20 million tests in total. Let me now show you what a bounding volume hierarchy is and how it is constructed. It looks like a tree. We start with a set of objects. First, we compute the bounding boxes of all objects. These are the leaves of the tree. Now we join pair of objects to build the first layer of internal nodes or branches. Each node stores the union of the bounding boxes of the object it contains. We want those bounding boxes to be as small as possible. Therefore, we want to group objects that are close together. Now we repeat this process. We create the next layer of nodes by pairing the nodes on the current layer. Each node stores the union of the bounding boxes of its children. Again, we want those bounding boxes to be small. Therefore, we group nodes on the first level that are close. We repeat this process until we only have one big node. This node contains the entire scene and it is called the root node. Here, I have drawn the bounding volume hierarchy as a tree. This way, it is easier to see the parent-child relations marked as arrows. In computer science, we draw trees upside down. The bounding volume hierarchy allows us to find overlapping objects efficiently. Let's assume we want to find all objects overlapping this gray area. A key observation is that if a region does not overlap the bounds of a node, we can ignore the entire subtree below this node. This is because the bounds of a node are the union of all the bounds below it. We start at the root node. The region overlaps the bounding box of the root node. In this case, we have to test both children. The region overlaps the left node, so we need to test both children of the left node. Now, only the right child overlaps the region. The left child does not, which means we can ignore the entire subtree. We repeat this process and find all the overlapping objects without having to test all objects in the scene. Let's assume we have h layers of nodes. Since each node has two children, the number of nodes doubles in each layer. This means if the height of the tree is h, the number of leaves is 2 to the power of h. This is only true for perfectly balanced trees, but similar for average trees. In a perfect case in which the bounds are small and we have to follow only one path down, the number of tests is h. In a scenario in which the size of the query bounds is close to the object sizes and the objects do not overlap much, the number of tests is not much bigger. In this case, we can solve the equation for h, which gives us h equals log 2 of n. The log 2 of n is the exponent of 2, which gives us n. The nice thing is that the log 2 function grows very slowly. For n equals 1000, it is approximately 10. 
for a million, about 20, and for a trillion, about 30. The question is, how can we create bounding box hierarchies? There are two main algorithms, the top-down and the bottom-up approach. We already saw the bottom-up approach. We started by grouping pairs of objects to form the lowest level nodes. Then we grouped the lowest level nodes to form larger nodes. We did this until we ended up with one single node, the root node. The problem with this approach is how to find pairs such that the bounding boxes of the nodes are small. This is easier to achieve with the top-down approach. Here we alternate the axes. We start with the x-axis and sort all object centers with respect to this axis. Then we split the objects into two equal sets, a left and a right set. We then repeat this process for both subsets recursively. In the next step, we take the y-axis. For static scenes, it doesn't matter much how fast the creation is, since we only have to do it once. In dynamic scenes, however, it is different. There are two main approaches to handle dynamic scenes. We can reorder parts of the tree dynamically. The problem is that such algorithms are complicated and heterogeneous. This means that they're not very well suited for a parallel implementation. The other option we have is to reconstruct the entire tree from scratch every time the scene changes. To speed things up, we can only recreate the tree every nth frame. To make sure we don't miss any collisions, we have to expand the bounds a bit. To make this method practical, we need a very fast tree construction algorithm. What would help is if we only needed to perform a single sort for the entire construction. Is this possible? Yes! We split the bounding box of the entire scene into a regular grid of cells. We don't store a data structure for this grid, we just use it conceptually. The number of cells in each dimension need to be equal and the power of two. We replace each object by its center. Then we compute the integer coordinates of the center. These are the coordinates of the cells in the grid. Here is the code to do this. We first clamp the coordinates of the centers within the grid to values between 0 and 1. Then we multiply by the number of cells along each axis and clamp to integer values. For a single sort, we need a single key from the two coordinates. Now comes the really clever idea. We want to alternate the axis again from top down. This can be achieved by interleaving the bits of the two coordinates. Here is an example. The first bit of the key is the first bit of the first coordinate. The second bit is the first bit of the second coordinate. The third bit is the second bit of the first coordinate. And the fourth bit is the second bit of the second coordinate. I guess you get the idea. What we get is the so-called Morton code. Here I wrote down the Morton codes for all cells in the grid. The first bit splits the grid into two halves along the x-axis. All cells with a 0 belong to the lower half, the cells with a 1 to the upper half. Now let's look at the lower part only. Here we see that the second bit splits the cells into two vertical halves. The same is true for the upper half. Here is the second half of the first half. Now it is the third bit which splits it into two halves. I'm following only one path. Here is the fourth split. The fifth and number six. Finally, we arrive at the leaf node which only contains one cell. Here is the part of the tree we just looked at. The leaf node we arrived at was 011001. To get there, we first picked the lower half, meaning we went to the left. Then we went to the right, to the right, to the left, to the left, and to the right. As you can see, the Morton code tells us exactly where in the tree we are. The main part of the top-down construction algorithm was to split a sorted list of objects of a node into two parts to create the child nodes. Here you see an example of the sorted list of Morton codes of a node. The first two bits of all codes are the same. This means we are in the subtree 0, 1. The third bit is the most significant bit that changes. Since the codes are sorted, this bit splits the codes into two separate lists, one for each subnode. If all keys are equal, we simply split in the middle. We are now ready to write down the entire algorithm. We first define a node class. It stores the bounds of all objects in the subtree. It also stores an ID of an object. This variable is only used for leaf nodes. The left and right pointers reference the children of the node. They are only used in internal nodes. The createTree function is the main function. We first create a list of pairs of object IDs and Morton codes. We sort this list by the Morton codes. Then we create the tree by calling the createSubtree function with the entire list. 
The create subtree function takes a list of ID and Morton code pairs. It also takes a begin and an end index. These indices define which part of the list should be taken to create the subtree. If begin and end are the same, we only have one ID. In this case, we create a leaf node. It contains the bounds of the object and the ID of the object. As a leaf node, it doesn't have children. We then return this leaf node. If the list is longer, we compute the middle index as we just saw in the previous slide. Now we create two children. For the left child, we use the list from the beginning to the middle index minus one. For the right child, we use the list from the middle index to the end. Once we have created the children, we can create the new node. Its bounds are the union of the bounds of the children. The index minus one indicates that this is an internal node. Then we add the pointers to the children we just created and return the node. I gave this pseudocode to Claude and told him to use an HTML page and the library 3.js to create a demo with moving boxes and Morton code-based collision detection. He wrote the complete demo you see here in one shot. I will link it in the description. We have 10,000 boxes moving through each other. As you can see, the construction of the BVH only takes between two and three milliseconds. And this is with unoptimized JavaScript code. This is far from being the bottleneck. Collision detection itself takes about 10 milliseconds. So together we would have over 60 frames per second. We have about 20 frames per second here. I guess the rest is taken by rendering and the creation of the shadow map.